if we are going to deconstruct the wall of distrust, you, you have to demonstrate value. Why is your building company, why is your service a lot different? How old are you gonna be before you start to experience life like you want it? I wanna tell you right now, whether you like it or not, there is a better way to do business. Hi everyone, welcome to the Business for Builders podcast. Welcome to you if you're in YouTube land. Uh, thanks for joining us. My name's Max, uh, the host of the show. I'm the CEO at Smith & Sons here in Canada. And uh, look, it's great to have you along. We wanna give you some uh, value as usual that you can pretty much take away and implement straight away. Uh, if you're rolling down the highway in between jobs, in between meetings, trust you're having a good good day. Uh, not just busy, but profitable. That's, uh, that's really what we need to be. Um, so today, uh, as usual, like and subscribe, hit the bell. Uh, we, we bump one of these out every uh, Thursday afternoon, I believe. And uh, hopefully it's, uh, it's, it's adding some value. It's helping you run a better or more high or a high, higher performance uh, type building and uh, construction business. So uh, as usual, we're, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming that I'm chatting with uh, general contractors or even subcontractors uh, or even business owners, uh, even those maybe thinking about getting into the general contracting world. Uh, welcome to the show. Right, today, what we've had is we do a lot of uh, Q&A, uh, live Q&A on Instagram and on TikTok. And uh, one of, the, uh, one of the, the recurring things is, uh, hey, Max, you know, how do we get better clients or how do we get more leads or whatever it is? So today I want to talk about real quick uh, in two or three points here, I want to talk about more leads, better clients. And, you know, I think that, you know, as much as we, you know, we, I think there's a lot of us guys and gals that really mean well in what we do. We, uh, you know, I think it's important that, and I'll get on to empathy later, but I think what you've got to understand is that you, I know you've got to pay your bills and I know you've got to make money and you've got to feed family. And I've got six kids, so I know exactly, you know, I was in my late 20s, early 30s, sort of putting a family together and I was running carpentry business back then. And so I understand the pressure that comes with uh, and having to deliver the goods uh, financially uh, and keep a household running. So I get it. I just want to, I guess what I want to do is add to that. I don't want to take away from that. I want to add to that. Um, and hopefully that would create longevity because we, we don't really have a choice once we're committed to that route. Um, we really have to maintain our course. And so what we want to do is every day, every week, every month that goes by, we want to maximize the return on our time investment, on our monetary investment, everything like that. And so, you know, what we want to do is, I guess, you know, having access to, let's say you do a little bit of marketing and you get clients that, you know, that call call you and ask for a quote or anything like that. What we want to do is make the most of those um, because, you know, they're not easy to get. And even when you do get in the door and you're chatting to them about a project, there's no guarantees, uh, you know, as it relates to the the outcome. So what I, I'm going to chat first, I'm going to, I'm going to talk about, the first thing I'm going to talk about is deconstructing the wall of distrust. The second point I'm going to cover off is qualifying the clients and then, you know, concluding with, uh, you know, how, you know, just a, a brief chat about systemizing your process. I want to try to make this one a bit of a quick one. I know that's a little bit of a tall order because I've got a bad habit of just, you know, yapping on for a long time. But um, look, I think deconstructing the wall of distrust, I know you might, you, you know, you mean well, <clears throat> you look good, you smell good, you talk good, but ultimately the clients maybe have watched enough HGTV horror story shows to, you know, not trust you, or maybe they've had a neighbor or they've got a family or a, a friend that, uh, has had a fairly negative experience. And there was actually one on Facebook rant and rave that I just took a screenshot, you know, where the person had paid this, you know, contract for $11,000 and he'd done from what the photos that I saw, he'd done a really rotten job. So, you know, those are the kinds of things that are, that are thrashing around in your community ecosystem and people talk to people. And of course, you know, the old rant and rave, you know, pages on Facebook are certainly... Um, littered with, you know, horror stories. So this is why when <clears throat> people want something done, they still, you know, then they know they can't do it for themselves perhaps. And so they've got to approach a general contractor. And so, you know, when you go out for that first meeting, understand you never get a second opportunity for a first impression. So it's important that, you know, you lead out with, you know, you know, your best foot forward, so to speak. Um, you know, and I think this is right from the get go is where, if we are going to deconstruct the wall of distrust, you, you have to demonstrate value. Why is your building company, why is your service a lot different? Matter of fact, I just responded to a guy uh, on, uh, on TikTok and he was asking the question about, you know, so, you know, should we just go fix price contract? And, 
you know, I think that's a, that's a, you know, you've probably heard me chat about, you know, the, the pros and cons between the two, but fixed price contracts to me is a way to move away from being just a commodity where you just get, you know, quoted around uh, and you move into what we call a service oriented business, whereby you become a design and build one stop shop all under one roof company uh, that makes it very difficult for you to be compared with others because you offer such a, a massive service. So when we're talking about go in there and demonstrate value because you want to deconstruct the wall of distrust, that is certainly a, you know, a good way to lead out. Uh, you know, so I often make it, you know, when I'm training general contractors, I'll say to them, I said, you've got to understand that you've got to build a network with architects, interior designers, geotechs, um, who else is in there? Uh, you know, all of the people that we need to put these design when we're trying to quote for the fixed price, we need the design services as well. And so we need to make sure that we have a good network of those uh, design services to ensure that we actually are a one-stop shop. You don't want to go saying that you are a one-stop shop and a design and build company when you don't have any, uh, you, you don't have any working relationships with those services. Um, and so it's you know super important that you you create the infrastructure uh, around yourself to be able to put your best foot forward with clients to start the process of demonstrating value. Now the other thing that I tell my guys is that. Uh, if you get, you know, one inquiry, let's say, and you give them one phone call, you do one site visit and you prepare a, uh, you know, a quote of some description or an indication or an estimate, and then you want to then ask for the business, that's a mistake. You know, I think that people do business with people that they know, like, and trust. You've heard me say that before. Uh, and because of that, you need to let time take its course as well. Any opportunity that I have to liaise with the client and talk to the client and sort of build rapport and relationship with the client and get them comfortable dealing with me. If I'm going to spend the time to do that, that's going to automatically generate a feeling of trust towards me as a general contractor. Now, if my competition is not doing that and they're doing a typical, you know, dude on a Saturday night move uh, where they're just flying in there for the biz, if you know what I mean, then you really, you, that's not going to fly with clients. Uh, and so you're going to, and if, if it does, you're probably going to, you know, it's probably going to be the wrong client. Uh, you might overstep the mark and do, you know, give them a really cheap indication if you're on cost plus and then you get into the project and all of a sudden you've blown their budget already and or then all hell breaks loose and it's not cool, which is another reason why we don't do cost plus. And so having those, ha spending time, investing the time, and this is where, you know, we'll talk a little bit further down the track about not, you know, being, you know, desperate, we want to be deliberate, we have a process, we do not deviate away from what we know is 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 a trusted process and is reliable. Uh, because two things, it's, it's there's a safeguard for the clients, and there's also a safeguard for you, the builder. Um, and so uh, that brings me to the next point is, you know, you really want to define the type of client that you want to work for. And we call that our preferred client profile. Um, because we don't do a lot of work for other businesses, for realtors, um, we, we don't do work directly for architects. If they're liaising with the client, we want to deal directly with the homeowner, with the end user. Um, usually they're going to be between 45 and 70 odd years of age. Uh, they're going to be maybe successful uh, corporate operators or successful business owners in their own right. Uh, and that, what that does is at least it's not, it's not a perfect science, but in our mind, we, we understand that when a lead comes in, we might even have a minimum threshold for the, 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 the type of work that we want to do. We might not quote on jobs less than 25,000. That's, that's part of defining the preferred client profile. And what that does is it, it really does help you sort of separate, you know, uh, those types of people uh, that, that come to you uh, that you may or may not want to work for. So, um, look, I think in doing that, you know, when you're talking about deconstructing the wall of distrust, you don't want to invest or spend a lot of time with somebody who is outside your preferred client profile. That's why we, those two go hand in hand. Uh, I want to invest in those individuals or homeowners or prospective clients that, that do fit my preferred client profile, and then I will go deep with those clients. I do want to, you know, obviously work through our, uh, what I call our preliminary building agreement or our quantity takeoff service, which is, you know, before we go to the construction contract, I want to work through that design and quote phase with those people. Uh, if they don't fit my design, pro, you know, if they don't fit my uh, preferred client profile, then I am probably going to figure out whatever the reason is they don't fit and let them know that there'll be, you know, that we're not in a position to present a bid for their project and we move on. So, because what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to, 
uh, for want of a better term, make life easier for me, but certainly less complicated. I want to use systems so I can leverage, which means I can get more work done for, for, for less input. Um, and I think it's all about being a bit of an assassin. Um, but really, if you are going to be an assassin, you, you're going to really want to have a sharp focus on what it is that you're trying to hit. Uh, if you've got a bit of a blurry vision there and you can't really see what you're trying to hit, then odds on is you're not going to get an outcome and you're going to waste a lot of ammo doing it. So really, uh, you know, uh, define it, the, the type of person and the type of, you know, buildings. And I talked about niche, you know, like that was something that's a bit of a, 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 a bit of a misunderstood term. It's like, well, if you define a niche, that means you're going to lose on, on all this other work. It's, it's not the case. If, if you can define like what Smith & Sons do is we focus mainly or mostly on renovations and remodels. And, and I think there's a lot of challenge there because it is that sector is, is tricky. I mean, it's hard to quote. However, if you can get it right and you can come up with a systemized approach to both the preliminary you know, building agreement process and also the actual construction process, and that's all underpinned by really accurate estimating and quoting, then what you can find is you can actually start to demanding a, you know, a premium for your services because you've been very scientific in your approach. Um, I think also to help deconstruct the wall of distrust, you need to apply empathy. Um, you know, it's finding, empathy is not, is not a weakness. Applying empathy is me listening to the client. Let's say we've confirmed in myself, my little checklist perhaps, you know, that this client is actually, you know, this is a person who's, who I could do it. Do, I could work with this. I like the chemistry. That's the other thing too, folks, rather than rushing straight into construction, the uh, quantity takeoff service or the preliminary build agreement where we're working through that design and quote phase is a great time for you to get to know the client to see if you want to work with that client. Uh, because nothing against you know other humans, but there's there's chemistry. I mean, I, last week, and this is this is an ongoing story. But I got a buddy of mine who's a fantastic musician, and uh, we 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 let one bass player go because it wasn't working out. And uh, he's a buddy of mine, and I've jammed with him heaps. And he came on, and it just it just wasn't going to work. There was some distance issues, and there were some other issues, bit of fragmentation, and uh, I literally had to fire one of my buddies from our cover band. And, and, you know, it's, it's, there's just, you know, you've, if, if that's the kind of trouble that I can find in a, a, a not-for-profit kind of venture like a cover rock and roll band, then absolutely you'll have it in dealing with clients. Uh, I think that it's important that as much as you want them to get to know you, the builder, and, you know, we know that, that they will do business with people they know, like, and trust, please don't, you know, uh, think that you have to, as a general contractor, work for everybody. Matter of fact, we've got through that quantity takeoff service process and decided that we're going to hand them all the information and all the reports and all the designs and all of the blueprints and everything like that. We're going to give it to them because uh, we don't feel like we're a fit and we're not going to go ahead with the construction of your business. Now, I know that sounds really far-fetched, but it has happened. And so, you know, I want you to understand that this is why, um, you know, we want to make sure that we're applying empathy. Yes, because we want them to, to, uh, to, to be uh, fulfilled as a customer. We want to f f make them feel like they're being looked after. Conversely, guys and gals, general contractors, um, your peace of mind and security is also important. So you need to balance this between don't just throw yourself at it and, and do everything good for the client when you're really doing yourself a disservice and you, you, you know, you may be, you know, wearing yourself too thin and spreading yourself too thin, things like that. You need to be mindful, listen to yourself. So as much as we're very client focused and we want to re-engineer the client experience and we want to remove the friction because friction, you know, generates heat and drag, both of which are really bad for business. The flip side is we are not robots and we've got to look after ourselves as well. So make sure that you're listening to your inner self and your intuition and, um, you know, make sure you, you're not just busy, uh, but you're busy being profitable. We need those two things to happen at the same time. Uh, and of course, the other thing, the main thing to help you deconstruct the wall of distrust is, uh, you know, you've got, to, you've got to reinforce in your marketing message what you're about. So how am I going to separate myself from the rest of the general contractors in my area? What... Uh, how am I going to not just be another tree in the forest where clients really can't tell us apart? So I've said this before, but you know, our, our, our claim to fame is that we provide fixed price building contracts. They include you know, a list of specifications and a completion date. 
Um, what that does for the client, that's a practical measurement measurement of what we do or a practical demonstration of what we do. And what that does when I apply empathy, I'm like, okay, so what's that going to do in the mind of a client? Right. It's going to give them peace of mind. It's going to give them security and it's going to give them satisfaction, especially both in the initial decision that they make to go ahead with Smith & Sons, but also as they go through the process, they're going, yes, this is why I signed up with Smith & Sons. Now, do we get it right all the time? No. Are we perfect? No. We're just like, we're just like you guys, uh, but we are striving to deliver construction services at the highest level. Um, and it's just going to be this ongoing thing as, as everybody individually evolves uh, and improves their, you know, uh, their ability. Um, you know, there's always new technologies that come on. Greater demands are placed on general contractors. Right now, we're having major supply chain issues, hearing that every day. And so, you know, it really does put pressure on us, you know, to be able to go, okay, what are we doing different? So something else that we do different here at Smith & Sons is we work hard. Matter of fact, next week we're heading to Victoria, uh, Vancouver Island, and uh, it's going to be a good time where I'm going to catch up with two of my general contractors. And whilst we're there, we're going to get three video testimonials. So this is what we do on behalf of our general contractors. I throw bo all of our, I throw both of our, our creatives in the truck and we'll head down, uh, we'll head down to Vancouver Island and we will, um, you know, we've got these meetings staged and set up and we go with all of our gear and we do all this on behalf of our general contractors. So, you know, when clients, you know, go and look at, let's say the the Nanaimo uh, Smith & Sons page, all of, all of Joey's, and you've seen Joey, if you've been watching the show, you've seen Joey, big beard, can't miss him. You've, you know, you've seen him. He's got all of his uh, testimonial videos on his part of the webpage on the smithandsons.ca website. And so when clients are trying to get to know uh, who Joey is, they can actually go and watch some of his past clients. Those videos do so much more of the heavy list lifting for Joey when he is trying uh, to build trust with clients. There's no nothing better than having a past client of yours chatting with a prospective client. Uh, I do it all the time here at even franchising. If you were talking to me as a general contractor in our disclosure document, you'll get a list of names with all of the numbers for all of our existing uh, and past uh, general contractors and you'll get to ring them. That's just part of the deal. You'll see if you, if you look on our Business for Builders website, you'll probably see a couple of the guys doing what we call a spotlight video, just chatting a little bit about their experience as a franchise general contractor with Smith & Sons. And so this is what we have to use. If you're not using the technology to give yourself a competitive advantage, um, you're not even in the game. Now, if you're happy just doing a couple of hundred thousand dollars a year, mazel tov, happy for you. If that's where you're at, that's where you're at. I would assume that if you're watching or listening to this right now, it's because you want to you want to develop a business you want to scale up a business you want to create more sales uh, you want to create more profit you want more lifestyle you want more bang for your buck um, and if you're going to do that then you've got to start doing and or at least investigating as to what it is that you can uh, you know do differently uh, that will help you stand out uh, rather than just be another tree in the forest and I've said this before go and take a look at smithandsons.ca I can't speak for any other Smith and Sons there's Australia and there's New Zealand I can't speak for those guys what I can speak for is North America or Canada specifically um, if I was you and, and you were like I'm hell-bent on making it work on my own good for you uh, what I would do is I would steer with my eyes and ears and I would go and take a look at what we're doing there and just copy that shit it's not rocket science. The, the, the thing is, you know, like I think the last uh, Q&A we had on Friday, people are sort of wanting our operations file. And, and odds on is that, I mean, I can give you that, but really it's the brand and the, the, the lead generation side of the business combined with all of those systemization, with all that systemization and all the documentation to support that. That's what's really going to help uh, you know, help you scale up a business, not just one. You can't just pick and choose. It's got to be all of those ingredients going together, applied at the right levels, at the right times. Uh, because again, every one of our general contractors, just like you, come from different backgrounds, different skill sets, different understandings, different strengths, different weaknesses as well. And therefore, they're going to need, in some cases, more training in some cases, but in, in some other cases, not as much because they pick that up. That's one of their strong suits. So uh, that's all about deconstructing the wall of distrust. Uh, if they don't trust you, uh, then you're never going to do business with them or anybody else. So keep that in mind. Second thing is qualifying clients. So it's like, okay, um, we've got the call come in and uh, you, you might have even done a first meeting. I think it's important that you understand that the statistics that we use is that for every 100 leads that we get, now you could probably break this down to 10, let's say. Let's say every 10 leads that you get, 
Um, 50% of those inquiries will go out the window. Now, some of them might be just uh, just just not even in the ballpark. And then others of those, you know, they might come with all good intentions, but they want a bathroom run out for 10 grand when it's really more like 25 or 30. Done. So you're going to lose 50% of your, your initial lead gen. Uh, out of that uh, 50% that remains, there, there usually is around about only 25% uh, that will make it through out of the out of the ten. So out of ten leads that you get, you're probably going to look at two and a half inquiries that are going to actually go ahead with work. Now, some of those. So essentially, what we're talking about is if people say to me, "What's your conversion rate?" I might say, "Well, it's 25% of gross number of leads." But those that we get close to, say where we talk about a bid to win ratio, we might be working on a 50% bid to win ratio as well. So uh, like I said, to keep it simple, out of 10 inquiries, you, you might only win one or two jobs, which means there's a lot of marketing work and a lot of, this is why when, when, when I hear guys and gals doing so much quoting work and they're not winning jobs, they become disgruntled, dissatisfied, disillusioned, pissed off, and they're hating the industry, they're hating the business, they're hating the clients, they're just getting the hate on everything. And the reason is because they don't have a systemized approach to qualifying. So um, you know, a lot of the time we're always looking for the red flags. Um, you know, I think any client that, I guess, when you've got a documented process like we do, hopefully you do as well. Maybe you've got you know a very well uh, a very well worn path as far as how you go about qualifying. I'm actually I'm looking for an excuse to qualify to disqualify a client. I, and what that does is if I cannot, what it does is by default, it'll lead me to a client that actually is going to be the one uh, that I would, would most likely want to work for. Any client that comes to us and says, oh, Max, I want to do this bathroom. I want to supply the toilet suite, the vanity, all the tap sets and the bath, blah, blah. Like that's, there's some guys and gals might not have a problem with that. But the way I want to build my business I know that if they supply a toilet suite and one of my guys kicks it over and it breaks, the client has to replace that. But what they're going to say is, oh, no, Max, it was one of your guys. You have to replace that. It's like, no, you supplied the material. See, this is where, this is where you know, my, my next point is don't let the tail wag the dog. This is why we need to have a very succinct, a very well-defined process as to what we do in all areas of our business because if we do not, you then give the power to the client. And I'm not saying you've got to go and be an asshole. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that leaders lead. You have a defined way of doing business, then do it that way. If someone steps outside that line, they either get back in line with your process or we basically part company. The clients will buy in accordance with our selling process. We don't sell in accordance with their buying process. It doesn't work that way. Um, you as a builder are going to drive yourself crazy if you're going to, because I'm telling you, if you get half a dozen of those, you, you, you basically you're going to be dancing all over the place to each of those clients' tunes. And you, dude, at the end of the day, you're trying to build a profitable business for you and your family. Who are you serving here? So do yourself a favor. Do your family a favor. Come up with some sort of system. Now, am I saying you've got to come up with a 20-page sales document that, we, that like we use? No, but you've got to come up with a one-page dot point at least to try and help you out you know, with that process. So um, super important that you really document that. Uh, don't let the tail wag the dog. Dog. Here's the other thing. If, you, if you're only, you know, I just said that you're going to burn 75% of your leads more, more often than not, and you're all of a sudden becoming very desperate um, that's that's going to be that's going to be a big problem. So what you can find yourself doing is trying to sell to the unsellable, which means you're really trying. You know, here's the thing: it's easier to give birth than it is to raise the dead. So you know, what I would urge you is 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 that if we are qualifying competently and professionally, and we do only get two and a half jobs out of ten inquiries, then we've got to make sure that our messaging. And this takes me back to you know what the marketing message is that you use. What are you using to set yourself apart from the competition? Uh, are you just another tree in the forest, or are you demonstrating value at the highest level? So you know, I think when when you know f when we're delivering, I mean, you've heard me say before, multiple multiple millions of dollars worth of inquiry goes out to our uh, entire group on a monthly basis, and that's because I understand this concept that we really need to load that top of funnel to give our guys the most choice when it comes to, there's no point in me giving them 10 leads a month when, you know, they, they, they need, you know, to win 10 jobs a month. Like it's just the math don't work out. 
And so if you're going to do a million dollars worth of sales this year, odds on is I'm going to have to produce $4 million worth of inquiry to ensure that we have that 25% conversion rate of gross lead numbers. Um, and again, so you're not going to generate over and above uh, an adequate an amount of leads if you're marketing. That's why marketing is tied to your profit margins. If, if you've got a great messaging, uh, great marketing, you're defining or demonstrating value, uh, odds on is you're going to be able to charge more money because like I said to a guy on TikTok on, on messages this morning, what we want to become is a boutique brand, a top shelf white glove kind of operation where clients who value quality uh, over price now and that's not saying that they don't look at look after they're not prudent with their numbers they are but they understand they get what you they get what they pay for so that you know there's a balance there so um, you know that's really important and that's really you know are they a quality oriented type customer or are they a cost oriented type customer and so I think it's important that you're always looking around and don't get me wrong I've seen some fairly well healed uh, clients that have been price oriented. You kind of walk in there and fancy house, fancy cars, fancy neighborhood, and yet you just know they're trying to grind me down. They're trying to, um, you know, screw me down on price. And if I get that vibe in the first meeting, odds on is they're going to get the no bid uh, email. And that, just so you know, that's in our, uh, there's an example of that, which I have written twice in my time in this country uh, before we really got cracking on selling franchises. Uh, I had to send two of those emails off myself. Um, so yeah, we want to make sure that we're working for the for the quality orientated, not the cost. The cost is going to nickel and dime stuff, uh, and they're going to make your life a misery, misery. And if you're trying to scale up business and you've got too many nickel and dime price oriented oriented uh, clients, you're just going to, you're basically going to create more stress for yourself. So sometimes it's better to get it is get quality over quantity. That's what we're talking about. If you're in the renovation game, if you're in new homes, margins are a bit tighter. Uh, you know, parity between builders is easier for the clients to define. Uh, it, it's it's just a little bit trickier, I think, when, you, when you're sort of a new home builder to maybe separate yourself. But nonetheless, it's totally possible uh, and it's just got to be focused on. So in conclusion, I think the thing we want to wrap up with is, uh, and you've heard me talk about it already, is systemize your process. We want to document all aspects and we want to have checklists. You know, uh, like I've said it before, when this show gets cracking, there's a checklist floating around the studio and uh, we quickly bounce through that to make sure that lights are on and cameras are this and, you know, soundboard is that. Uh, everything is in order because what it does is it takes the pressure off your head. You don't have to think about it. All you've got to look at it, cross-check it, good to go. Uh, if it's good enough for airline pilots uh, to go through a pre-takeoff and a post-takeoff check, uh, then it's good enough for us general contractors to ensure that we have our checklist together. Matter of fact, I've just put the finishing touches on. We've got guys coming in for training uh, we've got one guy coming in, uh, in, in about two and a half weeks and another one coming in about four weeks. <clears throat> and I'm just rehashing our, uh, our, uh, operations file and some of the PowerPoints and some of the, uh, the resources that are in our operations file. Uh, and I've just created just, just about, I'm just proofreading now the, uh, quality assurance checklist, which takes care of everything from site preparation right through to handover, um, and everything in between. So, so even if they don't use those, at least the resource is there, especially the guys that are on one man band. A lot of the time it is in their head and I don't subscribe to leaving it there. But here's what we do. Business in a box. Here's a 22 page checklist that means they can scale up quicker. Uh, but we also want to make sure that their uh, their financials are good as they do scale up. So um, document all aspects. And, uh, you know, part of that is uh, creating checklists. So documentation and also checklists. That's really what our operations file is full of. And so, um, look, I hope that helps. Um, that's me. We're looking forward to, uh, you know, if you get this on Thursday afternoon when it drops, uh, we've got a uh, TikTok and an Instagram Q&A. It's a great time where you can just bounce your questions in and we'll uh, bounce some answers back. Uh, we, we jam around everything and anything construction related and uh, it's always a good time. Also, uh, yeah, be, check, be, be, uh, be sure to check out the YouTube channel because, um, you know, there's some good stuff there as well. Hope that helps. Have a great day. Go build a kick-ass business. We will see you on the next episode. Cheers. Cheers.